Actually, we should say that there is a live audience here. Um, kind of, you can make a noise like, yay, yay there we are. <laughs> I should say a live, very biddable audience, yes. as you can hear, right? You know, what could we persuade these people to do if it was that easy? You, you ask yourself. But anyway, um, yes, just, it's, it's kind of an odd one here because as I was just saying to some of my pals in the audience there, um, I was brought up in Belfast, although, uh, although I lived here, um, and thought I was actually from Belfast. Uh, my parents, who were from the Highlands of Scotland, broke it to us at the age of 11 that we'd been born in Wolverhampton. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I mean, just what level of complexity did that introduce to life in 1973? I can tell you, it was kind of conceptually quite a lot. Uh, so we did actually leave in 1973, but I've, I've been back and done stuff ever since, uh, you know, quite a lot, and as you can hear, the accent certainly comes back when you've been reinforced with other people all around you. So I don't know if I'm home or not. I don't know sometimes if Scotland's home or not. And being here talking about Scotland in Belfast to you is confusing. Over to Pat. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was saying to uh, one of the audience, in Ian here, Ian Fraser, yeah, I thought it's, it's an interesting one to come over to Belfast because I'm Patrick Joyce with an extremely Irish name. My, my family were economic migrants at the end of the 19th century. Boo, send them back. And they, they came over initially to Wall's End, uh, then up to Govan, and then, thank God, they, they, they migrated to, to Dundee. So my family are from Galway. And my last time in Belfast was to see Horselips at the Black Box, for, for some of you may know that. But a, yeah, thank you. That's, but um, you know the generation we're speaking to, there's a cheer for, cheer for horse lips. But it was, it's great to be back here. And uh, as I say, my, my only other connection is my, my grandfather came here in 1917 as an essential worker to work at Harland and Wolf. Uh, I won't go into the family legend, but I think he lasted three days where he was sent back to govern <laughs> for, for various, various days. As my, my Granny MacDonald used to say, that man can start a fecht in an empty house. So, there we go. So, yeah, and I'm going to begin with a, a, bit, of, a bit of audience interaction here to, to, to kick us off with here in front of a live audience, studio audience, as used to say in every American sitcom in the 1960s. So, just to gauge where we're at, um, if I said to you, can any of you name the three candidates for the Scottish uh, SNP leadership election? Anybody name them? Oh, hooray. <laughs> Great. <Must be>. No. <laughs> Do you know, I was hearing this this morning when somebody on the wireless talked about Ash Sturgeon. And I thought, what are you doing now? Anyway, that was quite, you got one. Anyone, and I don't know, you probably don't want to use the mics. I'm sorry, anyone listening, you're not picking it up properly. Anyone else cut? I mean, you're listeners, you people. Use the mic. Oh, go so, on, because you're going to have to eventually. Go on, don't be scared of it, Michelle. Just make him use the mic. Forbes. Yes. Ash Regan. Ash Regan. And you had Humza Yousaf. Right. That's it. You've passed the test. Okay. So between you, as a collective audience, you passed the test. Um, I mean, the thing is, obviously, what we were thinking of talking about, we normally do a weekly podcast that picks up, you know, the, the latest news. So obviously, there was Boris and the shenanigans yesterday. And there's the ongoing um, sort of car crash, really, within the SNP and the Scottish Government. And there might be some aspects of what we, you know, what Scotland reckons about what's going on in Northern Ireland. But then, in a sense, you're more expert in that. Does that sound sort of roughly what you might not fall asleep to? Great. Um, well, Boris Johnson. I mean, you know, I can hardly stir the energy to actually speak about him because a, a bit of you thinks he thrives on this attention. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's critical or whether it's praise. He's like a, he's like a sort of, you know, attention seek. He, he, converts, he converts attention into energy. I mean, you know, and this keeps him going, that we're all sitting talking about him again, that he had that centre of attention, that happily he came on with the same shtick he's always done, the bluster, the sort of couldn't quite get his papers in order, the sort of really does any of this have to apply to me, the minute details, the sophistry, the kind of elegant language. And his own guys just got him like a firing squad, <laughs> just yeah. doofed him off one by one. You know, they like just were not having it anymore. Um, it does sort of suggest to you that the Tories have moved on a bit. But, um, you know, and this idea that Boris is ever going to make some comeback, 
who is actually breathing life into that? I don't read enough t t uh, you know, copies of the Telegraph to know if it's actually them. But who, I mean, because this, this keeps happening, this idea that Boris is somehow going to stage a comeback. But that's gone. You know, that has totally gone with yesterday. I don't see how anybody could think otherwise. No, totally agree, because, I mean, it was interesting when he started off when replying to Sir Bernard Jenkins saying, yes, Bernard, it didn't continue for that very long. And that was interesting to me as well, because what happened was that it was his own that turned on him. Yeah, I know there were Labour and the SNP there, but it was the four Tory MPs who really put the boot in. And I think we could see from that with... Uh, with Alberto Costa in particular, who is a, a loyalist in, the, in, in that sense, he's a conservative loyalist, he was putting the boot in, completely. I mean, they all started off with that whole business, oh, we do thank you for your service, Mr Johnson. What the great job you did during lockdown. But, but, but. And Johnson then did this whole thing of trying to say, well, of course, if I didn't understand the rules and I didn't follow the guidance, well, of course, the current prime minister did not do so either. And then we, we, we had the vote yesterday on the, the Windsor framework where they, the Tories did depend on opposition votes, and particularly Labour, to, to get it through because there were a substantial number of Tory MPs who abstained. So that's still going on there. But the, ER, the great ERG rebellion, I mean, it's your usual suspects. Redwood, Bone, Cash, Patel. And trust. By the way, trust. I mean, you know, yeah. trust and Boris Johnson. So there's your, I mean, there's your solidarity, actually, where you get the last two Tory prime ministers voting against flagship legislation. And, you know, obviously, I'm aware we're sitting in Northern Ireland. You've got views on this. You know more than us what, how people are hanging. Um, we had a very interesting taxi ride in with a very outspoken uh, taxi driver whose name we shall not mention because I think one is still sensitive to the idea that you can say one thing and then later somebody could just get in your cab and not really have liked that too much. But, I mean, his feeling, and I was reading the Belfast Telegraph this morning, is, you know, where is unionism now? I mean, does anybody want Stormont to re-sit? Do you want to have representatives who sit in Westminster now allied to a tiny fringe I mean, OK, back in the day, the uh, you know, European Research Group had muscle within the Tory party. It terrified people enough. Its shadow now made people think there was going to be some massive rebellion for no good reason, as it turned out. So these are kind of yesterday's generally men. If you want to be allied to that in Westminster and not have an active storm on, you know, kind of rock on. But it would be the question to me now is where... Unionism sits with on all of this. And indeed, your man was straight off it, you know, the minute we got into the car, pretty much, uh, talking about, about that, about where, you know, what, what uh, all these votes now mean for where Northern Ireland sits. So, I mean, there's plenty, of course, the fact that's probably not even come out very strongly in all the discussions tells you where you are, you're nowhere. And that is actually how Westminster works. There was a small period where, because of the numbers, um, the Democratic Unionists had the balance of power. It, w it was a tiny flickering moment, and it's gone. Um, and in, in the ordinary scheme of things, neither Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, or the north of England, let's face it, nothing really keeps the interest of Westminster for very long, except its own business, or in uh, Rishi Sunak's case, his own tax bill mm. that got sort of slipped out yesterday when nobody was looking, which is kind of large. I mean, you know, he's... He's a boy with a lot of packets of cornflakes on his shelves, you know. So, yeah, so that seems to me to be a, a big issue that comes out of all of this. But, you know, yeah. who knows if it'll be picked up. Yeah, because it was, I thought it was interesting, Robert Peston, who's usually, oh, that Robert Peston, very reliable. He was the man that turned around and said he saw the over £400,000 of tax uh, that uh, Sunak had paid. He says, it shows that he's relatively wealthy. I thought, who's his universe, Robert? You're relatively wealthy. I mean, that, take, that would take for some people, uh, 40 years mm -hmm. to earn that amount of money. And that's, that's what they regard as relatively wealthy. And just as that, that, that degree, of, a degree of separation there. But again, it's the, I, I think he's toast. I, think, I generally think Boris Johnson is toast, if I, what I can see from that. What I think will probably happen, it will not be uh, contempt, it will be reckless. I think mm. it will go that, and, and that, was, that was thrown out to him yesterday. Would you accept that you were reckless? Which is actually going to give him the, the worst of all worlds, because, I mean, if he was going to go out, he could go out with a bang. If he got a 10-day suspension or 11-day suspension, that would allow a, re a, a recall petition in his constituency. 
Everybody could go dancer. Let's get, you know, well, let's get going here. So, <laughs> you know, they could have done that. He would then have had to fight a by-election, which would have been, you know, let's just say interesting from every point of view, including his own. I mean, he could go out with a bang there. This is the worst of all worlds. He's beaten. He can't be arsed anymore, quite obviously. And he's got to keep turning up vaguely because he's not going to get a 10-day suspension. He's going to get, you know, two or three days. He's going to, you know, be humiliated. He's going to have lost. Um, you know, Rishi Sunak, who he had no time for, is going to sort of rise above all of this. Bre getting Brexit done. You know, Boris was going to go down with the ship holding that wee sign up. I got Brexit done. But actually, you know, arguably, the guy who got closer to it is this blasted guy that he voted against last night. So he's going to have to sit and suck it up in Westminster by continuing to be an MP, thanks to not being found absolutely guilty of, you know, driving lies right through the heart of the commons. So I think fair, fair, you know, hell mend him. He's now stuck in a place he doesn't want to be. And that is not in charge. Yeah. In the corner, you know. And, and while it is, you know, this is, this is the thing I keep coming back to this. While it is, while it is yeah, we can, we can watch this uh, comedy in some senses playing out in front of us. We've got to remember, this is the anniversary of the first lockdown. Things that three, yeah, three years the anniversary of the first lockdown. And when, and I thought it was interesting because somebody posted on Twitter yesterday the fact that they were talking about leaving dues. And somebody said, well, the leaving due I talk about is my mother's funeral. That's the leaving due I'm talking about. I mean, you've got to think of the, of the absolute coaching horses that they drove through what everybody else was sticking to. And that is, sticks in the throat. It sticks in the throat because what it showed is laws are for little people. Taxes are for little people. And the only muscle that, that we, again, because we're, we're going to move on to, to, to the SNP and the SNP leadership contest, the only muscle that Scotland currently has, as you know from what happened uh, during Brexit, the only muscle you have is the number of, uh, of votes that you get in every election, and that's the only time we're taking any interest in it, anybody pays attention to us, was the fact of the success, political success, of the SNP as a political party. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, I mean, as things stand at the moment, there was, I think it was maybe speaking to yourself about, uh, there's a general feeling, I suppose, that Scotland is like the, the big sister a wee bit for Northern Ireland, or kind of things work in Scotland. I mean, honest. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. And you get, I don't know, somebody had talked about being in Glasgow and it being pretty cool. Actually, it's always like that. I come here and I think, God, this place is far cooler than, well, Dundee. So yeah. that's, no, how did, no, okay, it isn't. Right. There's no but, place in the world cooler than Dundee. Okay, Dundee I, knew, I knew that would rouse you, yeah. but still. But, you know, the, the, the thing is, um, I mean, we are looking at your Northern Ireland Protocol with our jaws on the ground. Yeah. Because we should have had that. And how does any of this work? Because if this is an e a union of equals, just, you know, here we are then, I mean, we actually voted more strongly to, to remain in the EU than Northern Ireland did, uh, than any, any other re, you know, nation did. We had no council area in Scotland that voted leave. Not one council area. Right up to the border. It's quite extraordinary because there are rarely, you know, there's obviously issues with the border here. But that border between England and Scotland is like a cliff face now when it comes to all forms of different voting uh, demographics and so on. So, you know, literally across the border, there, were leave vo there was leave voting majorities in councils. Literally a mile away on the Scottish side of the border, there were remain voting majorities in seats held by the Conservatives. You know, in fairly, you know, in the borders that has not got, you know, let's say a red plaid side tradition. So actually Scotland was acting like a nation over an issue that no one even rated that highly because it just seemed like a no-brainer to Scots that of course we'd stay in the European Union. I think myself one reason was that when we were uh, going through the whole thing of the first independence referendum, the great kind of uh, charge that was levelled by the unionist side towards those of us who supported independence was that if you vote yes, you'll, you'll leave the European Union. You know, you'll not be able to... And so that inadvertently kept stressing the importance of being in the European Union because nobody was denying it in that referendum campaign. Both sides thought it was important. That's why the big stick was being taken out by the unionist side. So for Scots, we had two years of that. 
two years of everyone agreeing the European Union membership was absolutely key and the only argument was how voting which way would it affect it. So I think we went into the Brexit thing with a completely different mindset. Obviously, you want to be in the European Union. You know, nobody was arguing about it with us. So here you are thinking that there's groovier places in Scotland, you know, to have coffee or whatever it is you think is groovier over there, you know, or less litter, Michelle, um, which is obviously not true. You know, we just know when you're coming and get the old red carpet out and get, you know, the Hoover and all that sort of thing. But, um, but actually, when, if you look at it politically, you're freaking laughing, you guys. You have literally got the best of all worlds. I appreciate, you know, that's really s slicking over a lot of detail that is very important. But, you know, the capacity to grow your economy in both directions at once is one that nobody else in Britain has got. And actually, right now, every nation of the United Kingdom has got what it voted for in Brexit, except one. We live there. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that's the backdrop to where we are with a lot of this stuff, which is, of course, not where, where anything in the news is, because obviously this, the SNP leadership campaign has taken us away from these big, you know, realities and into the land of pelters. Yeah. Um, anybody, anybody not familiar with the word pelter? You're just going to go, I'm not going to tell you, if, because then you're going to exactly. make me speak. No. Um, <laughs> I mean, OK, so we've had Nicola Sturgeon unpredictably resigning perhaps about three weeks ago out of the blue. And, um, and then suddenly having an extremely quick election campaign with three candidates coming forward, um, who we have established, you know, between you, um, is Humza Yousaf, Ash Regan and Kate Forbes. That contest rapidly becoming quite unexpectedly heated. Uh, clearly, Humza Yousaf was a leadership candidate um, it was certainly noticeable that almost every MP or MSP, and that's a lot of people, were putting up videos with the same sort of framing, you know, so it obviously been a bit of an HQ, here's a frame, we'll do the video for you kind of moment, which yeah, didn't look probably too good. Um, at the same time, once the hustings and televised debates started, um, Kate Forbes had said what she said about not supporting equal marriage and then the list of things that she didn't agree with sort of got longer. Um, obviously, she said she's not going to apply that to it, roll back any existing laws. But if you live in Scot Scotland, where we've been almost at the forefront of everything that's kind of progressive and radical in terms of human rights stuff, you're not expecting to suddenly go back to the back of the class. You know? um, so that's kind of given everybody a bit of a, whoa, okay. Um, so we've gone from that we're trying to get our heads around trans stuff, which is difficult. Yeah. Uh, so, but that's where we're at, trying to get our heads around that. We're then going back to potentially that we might end up what having arguments again about abortion or gay marriage. I'm not saying that we will because she said she won't. But even that it's raised is kind of weird for a lot of Scots, you know. Um, and then Ash Reagan comes in, who looked like quite an outsider. She has taken a broadside to the internal lack of democracy in the SNP. Now, if any of you are listeners, you'll know we don't spend a week where we don't go on about this. Um, the SNP has been uh, like a movement since 2015. Um, I was listening in the corner to the last ever First Minister's Questions with Nicola Sturgeon today. And... Uh, Douglas Ross, or uh, I think has, who's, who's got, uh, Ross. it's your Dross, yes, your daughter. Um, well, Douglas Ross was trying in his last uh, attempt to kind of corner Nicola Sturgeon. I mean, she is uncornerable, if that's a word, and saying to her, he was trying to bring up all the stuff about the membership, that it's 30,000 less than they had promised it was, and people have resigned, including her husband, who was chief executive. He should never have been chief executive. Never, never. But anyway, um, her response to Douglas Ross was grand. What's the total number of uh, members of the Scottish Conservative Party then? Now, it's a bit cheeky because it's First Minister's questions, you know, she's meant to be answering them. <laughs> but it put all the heat back onto him. And in his three questions, she just kept asking him, well, what's the total? I mean, we know the answer is that the SNP have got more members than all the parties in Holyrood put together. But there's the problem. When, when there was this massive influx after the referendum, um, I think the party panicked. It didn't know how to control people. It didn't know how to 
have an agenda. It wasn't used to having more than 100,000 people. There was one point where the SNP was the third largest party by membership in Britain. You know, I'm not making excuses for them because you've got a tilt in your life. You've got an approach and their tilt has always been extremely controlling, um, which, and a small bunch of people making decisions. And, you know, yesterday I was sitting here in a Slugger O'Toole uh, podcast upstairs and there was two councillors who are leaving office now and they were asked how they thought Belfast Council worked with STV and I think more political parties within one council than probably anywhere else in Britain, but British Isles, right? And, you know, they both said they thought there was a strength in the, the number of different voices that were brought to the table. OK, people wrangled. OK, they had to find compromises and so on. But, you know, now you'll be the judge of whether that works generally. That doesn't happen in Scotland. We have one party that runs everything, which is the SNP. It's not they're not doing it. You know, they get voted in. That's because we have this unresolved constitutional issue that means this will keep happening, but it's not good. You know, we're not hearing 19 voices in one council. We're hearing one voice, which is the SNP. Then within the, the SNP, we're hearing one voice, which is Nicola Sturgeon. And that level of concentration, I mean, you can worship the woman if you like. I still don't want to hear one person, whether it's blooming God, practically on the pavement, running the whole of society. That's over as a way to run anything. And yet, actually, that's what has been happening. So for all of us who are kind of thinking in a normal shades of grey world, which actually doesn't really advocate it very well, in a spectrum of colour world, right, um, you would have lots of different inputs from people who had different takes on how you would get independence. But other stuff too, like land reform, like proper local control, like loads yeah. of things that we need to get on with. But we can't get on with it because we've got one thing that's keeping everyone bolted together, and that is not being able to have another independence referendum and being stuck, constitutionally stuck. So beware what you ogle, malas, because, you know, there might be better cappuccinos in Glasgow, but we are sitting here kind of looking back thinking, you know, yeah, I do heckle already. That's love it. Right. Yeah. Just on that point, is that working? Yeah. Who knows? Um, is this it, is now the audience leaping um, into action, actually. You know, just, you know, you're referring there to Belfast City Council and, you know, having so many different political parties here, Leslie, as opposed to one really strong party leading everything, it doesn't necessarily result in having better decisions made just because we have more parties. Sometimes that can result in only the decision, you know, decisions that are about... The, the, they, they pursue the lowest common denominator among mm -hmm. them. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. it stops them being bold. Because I did research into Belfast City Council and why they didn't adopt um, community wealth building, which they were looking mm -hmm. at before Preston. And oh, right, they never got onto it then. Pardon? So your point is they never got onto it. They were ahead yeah, of Preston, yeah, but they've happened. still not done it. And quite Hi. often here, you know, there can be some progress. I'm not denying that there's some. Yeah. But sometimes it just results in... Not very much happening, in my opinion. Sure. I mean, I, 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 um, I was wary of sort of crossing the invisible line into you guys know much more about this than me. And there you are. You, you know, I should never have bothered. But I would still think that the maybe an issue there is the general radicalness of your society. Like, what ideas are you ready to take on and run with? Maybe quite a lot, because I think Ireland has been further ahead with credit unions than Scotland. All sorts of social enterprises seem to work better in Ireland generally, both north and south. So there's, there's stuff that should provide some kind of template there. Scotland seems to me, as somebody who's kind of moved between the two of them, is very, has been very much about big government and government. I mean, we want to see things nationalised. We want to see stuff, uh, you know, controlled by the government. And actually, it's, been, it's taken a long time and I was involved with one of the big buyouts, the, 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 the Island of Egg buyout, the community buyout, to get another player put into the midst of that, which is actual humans that are not the government. It's still not councils. Our councils are humongous in size. So there's lots of structural problems. Pat's going to get a word in edgeways now, after this contribution again from our audience. Can I just comment on that? 
But, but on the other hand, from the, the perspective of here, and some Scottish accent, but it's been over here for quite a while and haven't lost the accent. Use it like a rock star, point it at your we, face. We, that, like no a rock point. star, end up singing then, we don't want to hear me singing no, rather than speaking. But the, 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 the other side of a strong government is you see things happening. The, the, some of the, the land buyouts would not have been possible had it not been for the fact that the Scottish Government, however that happened, created opportunities, created funds, encouraged folk to do things. It doesn't happen here. I mean, the, the only opportunity here that I'm aware of where any kind of publicly owned asset has been transferred was the courthouse in Bangor, which is now an interesting uh, multicultural arts, and it's interesting. But that, that's the only thing that's ever yeah. happened here. Uh, if we, we, we reflect, Belfast City Council probably is operating in a quite an interesting fashion, but we've no government here. There's a, no government here at all because a relatively, a, a minority, maybe I'll be a majority of unionists, but a minority of our population has decided that they're not going to play. So right, can no I just, just briefly come back and then I will shut up and let Pat Joyce have a word. Honestly, he's never been so quiet for like more than one second in his life. First, well, first thing is the Wyndham Act of 19 what? Oh, can't remember, 06 something, basically transferred tenant farms uh, to the people in Ireland, the whole of Ireland. So you, you had this massive transformation, the whole of Ireland, where tenant farmers got essentially, it was the, it was the biggest, um, I think, loan that the British government had ever engineered. It was a massive exercise to basically give a 60 year repayment period to all Irish farmers to basically be able to buy out their farms. And obviously people in the Republic didn't pay for very long before they were off ski, right? So they got a very good deal. But even people in the North who paid out over 60 years to, to buy their farm were laughing because that changed the face of, of Ireland completely in terms of land ownership. That was ready to happen in Scotland the same way as many things were ready to happen in Scotland. And then we had the First World War. And by the time we came back, it was off the agenda. So we never had that piece of reshaping that you had vis-a-vis. -vis. So our tenant farmers are still tenants. We're still scraping around in the margins, trying to fiddle, you know, make things a little fairer here, compensate people for being chipped off there. We didn't have that wholesale change you had. So. You know, there's one thing. Second thing, just point of information, egg was bought before the Scottish Parliament res was restored. There was no help from politicians. There was no help from government. Ascent, likewise. These guys got going, and I know I was sitting in those kitchens uh, watching the pounds roll in from grannies in Glasgow. It would break your heart with pride that people would sense that here was a moment that hadn't been orchestrated by politicians at all, it was guilt that brought the first Land Reform Acts in when the Scottish Parliament sat, because no one had helped. But I'll grant you, since then, there is now a fund that lets people go through it. But here, if you listen to the podcast, you'll see there's another blooming fly in the ointment struggling along, which is um, carbon offsetting, which means that land... I was speaking to the egg guys recently, and they figured that the, the island they bought for 1.56 million in 1997 might now be worth 40 million quid. No one can do a community buyout like that. So if, if the Scottish government thinks that having the little people come together and take on these Herculean tasks of taking on ownership of an estate that practically everyone else has run screaming from, it's, it's not going to be possible because all the funds, you know, you can have as much as you like in the Scottish Land Fund. Sorry, looking at the wrong person. Um, but it's not going to be enough to be able to buy you anything anymore because carbon offsetting is now the big cheese. And guys with lots of money, including very benign green people with lots of money, are coming in, buying estates, and the community is once again having to wait to see how they feel about little people. I mean, it's a green version of the old layers in many respects. So all I'm saying is, yeah, you know, you can look across and see that things look like they're a lot better there. But to be honest with you, I'd take the Wyndham Act any day. I would take wholesale change, properly funded, of the 5,000 tenant farmers in Scotland owning their land tomorrow as a game changer for Scotland and not the kind of little pots of money kind of approach, which is what we seem to... No, I'm going to shut up now, Pat Joyce speak. No, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, <laughs> as Leslie said, I mean, I had no option. Anyway, no, seriously, it, it's great because 
when, when, when listening to, to you about it, here's that whole aspect of how possibly I, I look at the Nordics. thinking, isn't that great? And then the minute you speak to someone from them, we say, ah, well, all these things are going wrong here. And that's, that's what it is there, because we talked about community wealth building. We have a great track record of saying, they're going to have a just transition. We're going to have community wealth building. And, and when's it going to happen? However, having done that classic Celtic thing of knocking ourselves around a little yeah. bit, and I, I was saying just when I was up in Strandtown, I saw a, 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 a sign saying, um, fail again, but fail better. And I thought, that's a classic sort of Celtic thing to say. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, you know you're going to fail, but your, 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 your hope is that you'll fail better this time. Um, you know, we, we have, I'm very struck by some things, for example, just to be a bit controversial, the 11 plus. I know Michelle will control herself, uh, but um, this is baffling to me how this is still, it's not still happening, but the business of kids having to be tested to get into grammar schools is. And uh, I mean, I crossed the water in 1973, smack on Scotland, just having decided to make a comprehensive system. So, I mean, Scots would be slightly baffled as to quite why anybody thinks that co anything but comprehensives are pretty good, really. Um, and it, it would be surprising to think that that is still sitting here. Right, I'm just going to put that in then. Because we were going to speak about the SNP um, and just uh, the, the candidates, as I was outlining them there, have, have been pretty aggressive with one another. They have also been aggressive um, yeah. in some respects, quite rightly, with the record of the Scottish government um, and particularly with the Nicola Sturgeon, Peter Murrell, her husband, own, sort of ownership pretty much of the SNP. So that has been, I mean, some days I've got to say to you, you wake up, look at the headlines, look at social media, particularly if you're feeling brave, oblique, stupid enough and feel physically sick because it feels like everything that you thought was solid you know, that you roughly knew where you were with something it seems to have suddenly been turned on its head. And it's your own folk that are basically taking lumps out of one another, which is always worse than someone who you didn't like anyway, trying to take lumps out of you. So at the moment, we're a quite, yeah, quite sort of shell-shocked set of people, I think, people who are independent supporters. And yet there's no way that there's going to be anything but independence for us as a, as a goal. No. I mean, because I des I'm desperate to get away from the constitutional question. Because continually it's asked of these candidates, uh, when, when the Scottish public are asked, what are the, and the, the latest poll shows this, when asked about what are the major issues, 87% of the people polled in Scotland said the cost of living crisis. That's not going to come as a surprise to anyone. Over 70% said it's the state of the NHS. You know, when people are asked about it, the constitution comes bottom, but I'm, I'm glad to see every single candidate has stuck to the point that you cannot resolve the issues that we're facing unless we become independent. Because currently, we are tied to a Conservative Party which is going to try and stage this revival based on the fact that every single ill that comes to us comes from refugees strung against the ch across the channel in small boats. And by the way, this constant reference to small boats, it's not small boats, it's people. It's people struggling to get away from whatever they're struggling to get away with. And in most cases, seeking to get away from war zones, etc. When you actually look at the numbers. So small boats are going to solve anything. And then we've got a Labour Party, which is, which is pandering to become elected. And this takes me right back, I remember, to 1979, when I was a, a card carry member of the Labour Party and campaigning for the Labour Party. And when we lost that election, I was sitting with people saying, tell them anything to get elected. Tell them anything and get elected. We've got to get elected. And that's what Keir Starmer has done. He has betrayed everything he said in that uh, campaign to become a leader of the Labour Party. He's turned his back on everything he believed in in order to secure the votes for people he presumes to be right-wing and think they're going to get their steelworks back because they've got Brexit and we're going to stop people coming across the channel. Then that's what he's based it upon. And the other aspect is there seems to be this great embracing of the fact this is going to be a Labour revival. There's a Labour revival coming down the line. And as Leslie said, in a country that voted in every single council area to remain within the European Union. And anyone that turns around and says that the SNP focused far too much time on Brexit and stopping Brexit and saying they shouldn't be focusing on independence forgets the fact that that actually, if there was ever a strategy, was a smart move to actually identify that fracture in politics in, across the UK that clearly identified Scotland right across the political spectrum as different. That's, that was a major point of difference. 
And as Leslie said as well, what we've got going on just now in this internecine warfare is people rubbishing their own record. And that I believe the Scottish government has an outstanding record in some areas. The latest one, I mean, we talked about was minim minimum unit pricing. Now, yeah. This is the, I, did, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but this is the minimum alcohol pricing. I, I was quite involved with this at the beginning because um, a woman called Evelyn Gillen, who was uh, in charge of alcohol concern, was the one who met with Nicola Sturgeon probably about 10 years ago, and over a period of years persuaded her that actually raising the unit price of alcohol might do something to tackle alcohol deaths where Scotland was leading the Europe, basically. Um, I mean, she took some persuading, and then the alcohol industry just got absolutely wellied in. Um, the Scotch Whiskey Association, which is actually sounds like all of you are thinking, ooh, Scotch whiskey, ooh, yes, and you're just conjuring up your favourite malt, aren't you? You just kind of, can you smell it now even? Just it's like peaty and ooh. That's not who they are. They're vodka producers, right? The Scotch Whiskey Association is a front for basically cheap white like alcohol, and they took the Scottish government up to every kind of court imaginable. They ended up in the European court over this minimum alcohol pricing, um, with all sorts of argument being put forward. I mean, actually, they could have been advising Boris on his approach yesterday because it was that level of nitpicking, you can't do this because. And finally, they lost every single legal challenge. So Scotland became the first government in the world to put forward an increase, I can't remember if it was 50 pence per unit, which brought up the price of the cheapest stuff that is the most likely to be used by people who are likely to keep drinking until they kill themselves. Um, and it was controversial. I mean, you know, there's a, there's, I remember there's a chew in the fat sketch in Scotland, uh, which um, ha always featured that phrase, you've got to drink. And I'll tell you, as someone who's been a teetotaler for 23 years, Scotland is kind of not being very cheery about the idea that you don't drink, you know. Um, so drinking is kind of, I, d I think you know what I'm saying here as well. It's kind of in with the bricks. If you don't drink, you're just a bit boring. Um, so all of that sits within a really deep, not knitted together bit of the Celtic psyche that we absolutely have to start unravelling. And it was quite a big moment that Scotland moved forward on that one. So anyway, off it went, the policy went, and it had a sunset clause built into it for five years hence, in case it was a pile of mints. And um, it has been the independent uh, researchers and scientists have done the comparison with England that didn't have that measure, and has discovered that um, 150 people were saved from death the first year. They're uh, they're hesitant to extrapolate it to the full five years because most of them are COVID years when actually more people were drinking everywhere. But still, it looks like there's been 750 lives saved. Now, the 150 that was saved in two, 2018, um, the uh, original um, pr prognostication for that was that it would take 20 years to save those many lives. That was the people who devised the legislation. That was Evelyn. She thought it would take 20 years to save 100 people, and 150 lives were saved in the first year. So, like, the thing is, has anybody in Scotland been going, oh, well, my God, we did something kind of, you know, sort of all, no. Because where we are now is that everybody has taken blimmin' lumps out of each other. And actually, when the Scottish government has done something that's really quite good, and okay, we're not putting our heads that far over the parapet, We've got big addiction problems. Absolutely we have. But everyone's going to have to get to this point. We have got alcohol swelling around the British Isles that's cheaper than bottled water. We have more outlets in working class places than uh, we have anywhere else. If you want to kind of deal with, instead of just having lots of moral high ground possessing in discussions about addiction, you need to look at the blinking facts of where people are having stuff thrown at them and how, and have the courage to go in there and argue for things people don't like, which is things have to get more expensive as one way, one way, lots of other things necessary. That conversation happened in Scotland and we've forgotten it. So can you imagine if those guys, if the Beaks had come back and said, oh, I see the minimum alcohol pricing, nothing happened. You spent all that time and effort and it didn't work. Can you imagine the headlines there would have been? Another failure for the Scottish <laughs> government. Ferries, yeah. minimum alcohol pricing, you know, the full nine yards. 
And yet, when something worked, there's been next to no cover of it, of, of it you know. So it's a crazy place that we're at. And I'm conscious that you guys need to get a word in edgeways now, actually. Yeah. Can, I, can I chip in, Well, just to say very quickly, but are people more familiar with the concept of a Section 35 order? Well, some of you may be. But what that, what the Section 35 order, which was used for the very first time with the gender recognition sort of, uh, legislation that's passed in Scotland, allows the, the UK government to say no. And we reckon, I think, that they would have stuck this on the minimum unit pricing and stopped it. But as Leslie said, that's what we can do. And we're not, as Humzi Yusuf said, subject to a, a foreign government coming in and telling us what to do. And that is actually the British government that's now brought the rain on um, above. You, you're all beginning to hear strange things happening to the lights. Um, I jest, I jest. But yeah, the point is there that we're, we're sort of sitting with stuff that we were able to do. We were able to vary the terms of trade on pricing of, of alcohol. We can't now because of the internal market uh, legislation, which allows the, the British government to say, Look, they're desperate to get trade deals, so that, that we have to look like we're one market. Apart from you guys, you yeah. are flies in the ointment, but you're allowed to be flies in the ointment because you're so special. You, of course you are. <laughs> but, you know, for, for just boring old Johnnies in Scotland, we're not special enough, and anything that we want to do that would vary if we want to have different regulations, nah. If we want to try to be a little bit more benign, you know, in kind of the way that we support certain industries, nah. The things that were supposed to be benefits of Brexit, where you could actually subsidise state things at long last because, you know, you didn't have to be fair to somebody from France, nah. Because you need to stick to a straight and narrow, defined by what London's regulations are, for them to be able to go and make one trade deal with someone, which will inevitably be worse than the trade deal already Thank negotiated yeah. by the EU on our all, all our behalf, which is where we are now. So there's a big turmoil for us in Scotland for all sorts of reasons, not just this passage of Nicola Sturgeon, um, because we're entering a new stage of devolution, which I hope you guys will soon have the misfortune to be part of as well, <laughs> where you kind of have a, a, a par a, an assembly sitting again which nonetheless is wrestling with having all its powers undermined at the very moment that you're back in the game. Because really, that's where we are in Scotland, grumbling old what's it that we are. So, look, there's lots of thoughts cast at you, and doubtless you've got sort of things to say. Well, you did have before you, we yeah. ranted at you and you sort of <laughs> nodded off. But um, thoughts, recitations, songs, points. But no football. No football out, or? Oh, no, 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 not, not yet. We can have that discussion later. I'm, I'm a Jags fan, so that's okay. Yeah, but as I said, no football. I share, I share your message. As the, if the SNP implodes, is SNP synonymous with the nationalist movement or not? Is there a distinction? Well, um, no. In that I have been personally very involved with, you know, with independence and I've never been a, part, a member of the SNP mostly because of bad experiences in my youth it just left me to ha have a deep suspicion of political parties, I have to say. And, you know, this is... Somebody probably has to do it. But it's, it's not a pretty sight. Um, and it, so the SNP is probably the main expression at a political, you know, party level of independent support. So even people like both of us who are pretty critical of the SNP about a lot of things will still knuckle down and vote SNP yeah. come the day because... What else? You could vote green. Sometimes people, you know, we do vote green. Um, but by and large, it is the SNP um, that's that vehicle. This, um, this is not the same. Obviously, on the unionist side, there are shades of not, well, I would say shades of grey. Let's be generous. The spectrum of colour, um, <laughs> which is the Lib Dems, Labour and the Tories. So you can have your shades of unionism and you can vote for the different one accordingly. Now, we don't have STV for our elections, so that essentially penalises the unionist side somewhat because we still have, you know, there's this a less proportional system. So they get annoyed that basically the SNP has mopped up the whole of the independents, 45 to 50 percent, whereas their 50 percent is split between three, which means they get less of a shout. So that's roughly where the party politics of it is. 
But the wider yes movement has, well, let's say, on, uh, on coronation day, which is so important uh, to democracy that I see that it's doofed your local elections two weeks along, because you've got to remember what's more important in life, right? Um, <coughs> we will be having a large march in Glasgow to demand a republic. So that's not SNP policy by a long chalk, I'll tell you, Yet. because SNP policy has generally been, let's not frighten the horses, um, even though the majority of Scots favour a republic in every opinion poll that's been taken. So, you know, there's a, the, the, the wider movement is much friskier, let's say, on many subjects than the SNP. Yeah, I mean, as Leslie said, I mean, I, I, I've got to come out here. I, I, I joined the SNP in 1967, left it in 1968. Yeah, and I joined the SNP again in 2014 and left in 2015 because I couldn't afford it. I'm not a party political person. I just, I just don't like to be tied down to that, that kind of thing. But I will vote SNP uh, in every Westminster election. And I will vote SNP and another, Green, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, the Holyrood elections. Because, I mean, that seemed to me was the way to try and maximise the number of people with whom the, the proportion of their policies I could agree with. You know, when it comes to independence, I will be in a political, the, the, the Loki Republican Party, you know, and self-determination, self whatever it is, I, I'm that kind of, kind of individual. But, we've, we've, but the, that, that is the narrative that's currently presented, that the SNP is the yes movement. It is a political representation that we have to have, but it does not represent, I think, the, the, the perspective of, of the broader movement. But the other thing about it is, is that rumours of its demise are greatly exaggerated. I think people will continue to vote SNP because, because it's the constitution, stupid. You know, that's it. You know, they may disagree on policy, but people have now come to that point where that's what they make. So every election in Scotland's a referendum, which is a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose my observation is, as a Scot who's been living over here for sort of 20 odd plus years, is that there just seems to be, as you said, your SNP is the vehicle for that movement for independence. And I just wonder if it would be far healthier for the wider political debate if there were more parties that were in favour of it. Because what surprises me is everything you've discussed so far, post their first referendum, or the referendum, whatever you want to look at it, you know, and given Brexit, etc., that the, the opinion polls haven't shifted dramatically. You know, let's call it as it is. It's 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 there or there about 50-50. Yeah. You know, where's the where's the 60-40, the 70-30? And for my take, I can't help but think if you get to that 60-40, then you get the momentum that takes you to the to the 70-30, and then you've got more of society on the side. I look at what ha happens clearly with the Northern Ireland, it's 50-50, and you know, it feels like somebody's always being left behind. Similarly, within Brexit, it feels like that referendum feels like somebody's been left behind. And I'm not a minority, a big, big, big minority, you know. To me, that's, to me, I wonder if that's what's going to start coming out of SNP at the moment. I mean, that's pretty spot on. You know, all of yeah. those things are absolutely true. Um, I mean, it strikes me as <clears throat> uh, the, the, the difficulty within the present constitutional setup is that unless you look essentially bigger than your parts in uh, Westminster's eyes, let's just go back to how you've been airbrushed. You know, this, this place has been airbrushed because you don't have any leverage anymore. Size matters. You know, mo the momentary size matters within the Westminster context. So if the SNP had been sprinkled across two or three parties, which might more accurately reflect, you know, what the different demands are, um, you would end up probably with less of a you know, you, you would you just look less big within the people know there's clout with the SNP. Look at the voting statistics on on the the, the storm on break thing last night. I mean, there was 43 SNP MPs. That's quite a quite a posse. You know, you've got a bit of clout when you're leading something with 43. I'll grant you, you got a bit of clout, and then equally none. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there is. I think you get to a point where you're thinking, okay being like a shield wall to go to the old Viking analogies, right? Which is, I think, what we've been trying to do. We've got a shield wall where we've got us all together. We've got us all, all our shields planked together and we're moving forward. We're just going to move this thing through sheer effort. That's not really worked. And in the meantime, we don't have a good enough set of debates in the Scottish Parliament, which is, after all, what's meant to be the more important one. Um, 
So, yes, I think there's probably got to be some splintering up. Now, having said that, I have been foolish enough in my own lifetime to try and set up a small political party. I don't know if anyone else has tried it in the room. I'd rather have four babies simultaneously than ever do that again. You know, it's like respect to all the people who did this in the early part of the last century, because it's not easy. And um, you've got to be, you've got to be democratic. You've got to have branches everywhere. You've got to, oh boy, it, it's incredibly difficult, as Alba are finding. Um, and if it looks like it's built upon one person's ego or doesn't really hang together in a very attractive way, or to be fair to Alba, gets no airtime. Because as soon as you start something up that's new and small, you disappear. I mean, again, I'm taking my life in my hands here, but just looking at, or, or you become essentially important only in so far as you scare one of the bigger players. I'm thinking here about potentially a small group that kind of scares the DUP. Um, you know, so that's what your future becomes. Well, is that worth the candle? Obviously, as people here think it is, but I don't know if that really helps you much. So it's quite difficult to start again and with a whole... Now, the other thing about how you get people to a higher level of support for independence, this one's tough. I've just spent the last four months writing a book that was submitted at 6.42 a.m. on Monday. Yes! <laughs> Um, called Thrive, which um, is unashamedly optimistic about, you know, independence, tries to deal with an awful lot of the sort of deep-seated misgivings about our own capacity, uh, which I think are at the base of a lot of the hesitation um, and a lot of the doubt there is about the worth of Scotland, its land, its capacity, its resources. I think a lot of people think we're, we've been sold a pup. Scotland is a barren desert. It's only good for having his grouse moors. That's why a fifth of it is a driven grouse moor. Um, it is, I mean, you know, as we would now look at countries, when you look at the resources we've got, okay, it rains. We've got water. Do you know what water is? Gold dust. It's modern gold dust. Pre predictions are the south of England will run out of water in 30 years' time. And, you know, there was one of Boris's big plans was actually ma managing to build a conduit that would take Scottish water right down the spine of England through a series of canals, divert it into the Severn and into the south of, of, of England. You know, if you were being generous, and sometimes I would be, um, you might think, well, if we've got a lot of water, whatever, there is so much leakage because there are 19 privatised uh, um, water companies in England whose leak leakage rate is unbelievable. They're not reinvesting. They're not fixing what they've got. And they're facing a situation of running out of water in 30 years' time. So, you know, we've got to turn this around because people will look at Scotland, Scots and Scotland, and think, oh, God, Scotland, what's it like? I mean, it can be nice on a good day. Then there's midges <laughs> and then it rains. Dancer that it rains. Thank God that it rains. We've got water. Now, it takes a long time to turn these thoughts around. Some of this is not going to be quick. But the only way you get a moment to get in and sort of, you know, try to change people's thinkings is campaigns, is elections. You've got to have moments where people stop for a second or longer and try to orientate their thinking on this. And that's the difficulty. If we don't have a referendum campaign, nobody comes to a decision. I mean, how many people in this room have, have got a green, have got an electric car? I'll tell you for the radio audience, not a hand went up, right. <laughs> now, who thinks green, you know, electric cars are probably the future? Um, nobody's going to put their hands up because they're a blooming curmudgeonly bunch now. Yeah, they've all jumped into action, right. So, see, there's a gap between what you think needs to happen and what you have already done. What will make you do that? Either a deadline, well, the best thing, a deadline and a bung, <laughs> right? So you'll, you'll be latently, however I interview you or ask that question, you'll either look like you're a bunch of petrol heads because you haven't got green, you know, electric cars, or you'll look like a bunch of people who are really ready to go given sufficient incentive. Now, that's where we are with this. And the only way we get further, I think, is by having an election that's fairly focused on it. And that's been what a lot of this campaign's about. And I think we shall probably run out of time soon. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, well, the only thing I was waiting to add is there is a demographic change taking place as well, which is not seen in some of, of my <coughs> advanced years, in the fact that if you actually look at the under-55s, they, 
it's, it's, it is that 70-30, 60-40 split mm -hmm. where people are utterly convinced about it. I was saying to Leslie when I talked to my son who's just about to turn 40 and my, 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 my daughter's, I can't, I can't identify anyone who isn't committed to Scottish independence for social democratic reasons. And that's the other element I want to see. I want to see a Scottish government, and I think talking about competent government, but it's a competent government that actually puts in practice progressive Fiscal policies, as far as I'm concerned. Let's talk about poverty. Let's talk about taxing uh, uh, land reform. Let's talk about wealth tax. Let's talk about sorting these things out and actually show the benefits within the framework of that what we actually have and through competent, progressive government, show people what a potential Scotland could be like if we controlled all the levers. So yes, there has to be a focus on a campaign. The other thing that goes against the split of the SNP is the fact that they're still running this this mixture master of a system for Holyrood, which is first past the post in your constituency for your first vote, and then you've got your list vote. So no party is going to split when it's a first past the post vote system to get the majority of your MSPs in place. But yeah, it's a great question. I mean- well, We've got another one here. So uh, just after the Brexit referendum, I, I was talking to friends and I, I said something along the lines of, I think, I can see Scottish independence within 20 years and maybe something happening in Northern Ireland um, within 30 years. I mean, maybe we could push that forward to 21 when Brexit actually took effect. But what would you think about that sort of timeline? Or I guess a, a, another question, do you see anything, you know, people sometimes float, you know, ideas about, okay, have like a Scottish, Irish, you know, alliance, union, you know, that would maybe make people in Northern Ireland feel better. Do you think anything like that would be a, a runner from a Scottish perspective? Well, it's, it's sweet, actually. I, I mean, personally speaking, that works for me. If we could pull Wolverhampton in as well, I'd, <laughs> they'd all be together in my brain for the first time ever. But, um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 thing, the thing is the demographics. And I'm struggling because this is like what happens now. You have something in your head and then you forget completely who said it. <laughs> but pretty much every commentator is looking at the prospects for reunification in Ireland and independence in Scotland and thinking that, you know, in the same way as you will now have a Sinn Féin first minister, like you just will, because the demographics have changed enough for that to be the case, this, this river continues to flow. It's not going to stop. So new generations have got different outlooks and those ones, as Pat said, are pretty much going in one direction in both those places. Um, of course, there's a lot of events that will happen in the meantime, you know, that can just throw people, um, throw people's confidence. Uh, but, you know, you've got to a stage now where I think um, Britain is looking very doomed. And this is the other bit of it, because we spend a lot of time beating ourselves up. We are world champions at beating ourselves up, the Celts. Um, I really would defy any other nation. When I go around the Nordics, which I do a lot because I, I run a thing called Nordic Horizons, and I start that sort of slight, oh, we're pretty crap at this, they'll actually get so embarrassed <laughs> that you're beating yourself up because it's like not what they do that they'll come in and say, yeah, but you have got some pretty good whiskey, you know, whatever. And you go, God, oh, yeah. But so, you know, this the instinct to beat yourself up definitely has to be sort of resisted. But I mean, that is the drift of, of where we're going. And I think a lot of people will just feel that it's the vehicle, the moment, that's the thing to argue about. But overall, um, Britain is a busted flush. And if you want to finally stop beating yourselves up and just turn and have a look at what happened yesterday, you know, if you got to the stage where you're, you're Rishi Sunak, who's kind of like standing in front of everybody going, whoop, whoop for Northern Ireland. Look what we got for you. My God, you've got the best of all worlds. Yeah, where we were seven years ago, matey, before you decided to go into this, you know, sort of, sorry, I could think of very unpleasant ways to do this, but something measuring competition to try and prove <laughs> that basically Britain is somehow still unique. And that it is absolutely, without needing to know more detail, better just unreflectively, inherently better than anything else that could happen in any other country. And I don't know how you feel about this here, but it's that that just makes me sick because we all know it's not true. And it, I mean, if there's one essential thing that is just so hard to grasp about the kind of tilt of 
British politics, it is that assumption that the mother of parliaments is somehow infinitely superior. 10% of seats in Westminster have not changed hands since Queen Victoria. Thanks to the utterly not very modern at all first past the post system that no one wants to dismantle. Not Labour, it's not a priority. So we will just continue to go on like this. You guys, with your new opportunities to kind of, you know, export, bypass Britain, bypass everything and trade directly with the continent, will rock on, hopefully. Um, and the rest of us will all be stuck with shitey trade deals, like the one that was um, hatched with Australia, which is basically letting more Australian and New Zealand imported beef to Britain than all 27 of the EU countries would allow in five years. That's, yep. And that is how our farmers are being, you know, not protected. Wait until there are trade deals with Brazil and Argentina. You can, you, you know, go and look on the hills now because you won't see those Aberdeen Angus there anymore the next time you go because that's not the plan. The plan, the Tory plan is just trade. It is, why should we have anything if we can get something cheaper from somewhere else? And so, you know, we will, these trade deals will be the death of most of the conventional bits of energy security, food security, all forms of the security that come from being able to feed and deal with your own people. It's just, it's utterly a direction I cannot thaw. And that's where we've got to make a choice. You know, the intelligence is about not having to go right up a cul-de-sac and smack into the back wall to notice that it's not going anywhere. Or, if you want, knock yourselves out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one because we're, we're about to come to a conclusion here, but I noticed that there was a reference to being a nationalist. I'm an internationalist. I'm a socialist. I always have believed in socialism uh, of a varying non-state sort and all that kind of frothy nonsense that I can go into, but I won't. I'm an internationalist. And the more we can reach out and cooperate in a world that is being challenged by climate change, it's, an abs it's not the right thing to do morally, it's the right thing to do on all sorts of levels. And this is the point usually in the podcast where I have to think quickly about how to round all this up and come out with a witty a witty exit before I, I come up. And all I've got, and this is nothing to you, all I've got to say to you is thanks to the old chums who have come along today, thanks to the new chums that we've got live in the audience, thanks to those out there who, who may have listened to the podcast before who are watching the live stream, thank you. And if you want to hear more of this from us, uh, it's the Leslie Riddick podcast dot forward lesliereddick.com forward slash podcast I'll do that again lesliereddick.com forward slash podcast and fingers crossed we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday chums <laughs> sorry that threw me because I sort of thought, are you all going to come back to Scotland with us and then we can do this all again on Tuesday? And I should have said as well, big thanks to the Imagine Belfast absolutely. crew. Absolutely. So, absolutely Thank brilliant. Thank you. That's been superb, guys. Yep. And I will make sure that that's said in the podcast tonight. To thanks. Thank Marty, Richard, Sarah and Molly for all the great help today. Thank you. Grant. Thanks. That's, yep. that was Thank great, you for coming. guys. <laughs> Thank you.